Hi, I'm Johnny Enoch, and today we're out at the Roundhouse Station here in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And although this place used to be used for old school transportation and trains, today we're going a bit into the future, and we're going to be discussing quantum access, time travel, and teleportation. Today's guest will be Andrew Bushago, who's a lawyer, as well as Alfred Lambermont Weber, the founder of ExoPolitics, and we're going to take you to an exciting place that no one's ever gone to. So stay tuned time travelers so we're here today with Andrew Bushigo who's a lawyer and a whistleblower on Project Pegasus and uh, Andrew can you tell us a little bit about what you're talking about today I was um, talking about my experiences in DARPA's Project Pegasus which was the US time space program at the time of its emergence in the late 1960s and, and uh, early 1970s okay and can you tell me, has the U.S. government in, been involved in teleportation and time travel? Yes, the United States government developed teleportation uh, by 1967-68. We know that's, that's the case because when my late father, Raymond F. Chicago, and I teleported from the old Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Water Ridge, New Jersey, uh, and then hopped into view in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and we drove up to the Los Alamos National Labs. When we met with Dr. Harold Agnew at the labs, who was heading up Project Pegasus, or what became Project Pegasus at that time, uh, he asked my father how old I was, and we both said, my late father and I said, six. So that indicates that that meeting with Dr. Agnew at the Los Alamos Labs at the time that he was the director of the W Division, the weapons division of the lab, had to have taken place between September of 1967 and September of 1968. And at that point, physical teleportation via a Tesla teleporter with relocation uh, from one point to another through a mortal tunnel in time space was fully operational secretly in the U.S. defense community. Fascinating. So today we're at the Roundhouse Station, which has been used for old school transportation as well as trains. What does this new transportation system mean of this teleportation? Uh, what does that mean for tomorrow's, tomorrow's world and its impact on the environment? Well, the form of teleportation that emerged secretly in the U.S. defense technical community in the late 1960s um, was based on a discovery that was made by Nikola Tesla. Tesla discovered a form of energy that is latent and pervasive in the physical universe that we call radiant energy. It's not the ball lightning and the more conventional forms of electricity that he's associated with in conventional history. It was an energy that he discovered that he kept secret called radiant energy that has among its inherent properties the capacity to bend time-space. So at Curtis Wright, there was an object that consisted basically of two parentheses-shaped booms between which the Defense Department of the United States had found a way to broadcast this radiant energy. And when we jumped through that curtain of shimmering uh, radiant energy, we found ourselves in a vortal tunnel passing through time space. In other words, the inertia of our bodies passing through the field of radiant energy opened up a kind of a pocket in the fabric of time space and when that bubble closed we were repositioned elsewhere on the face of our planet either in real time or with the displacement to the past or future but because the technology was an emergent technology and they wanted to avoid us being stranded by for example teleporting too back too, too far back in the past uh, we were usually just teleporting in real time so if, for example we jumped through the device at 9.15 a.m. in New Jersey when we arrived, it was 7.15 you know, mountain time in New Mexico. Fascinating. Within this technology that we have, can you tell me the difference between, can you tell me the difference between the Montauk project, Project Looking Glass, and this Project Pegasus that you talk about? Project Pegasus emerged under the aegis of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, um, in the late 60s and encompassed at least eight different forms of gathering information about past and future events by either propagating a hologram of such an event or physically traveling there. Um, the two primary technologies 
were a teleporter based on the writings of Nikola Tesla and a device called a chronovisor that propagates moving colored holograms of past and future events. That was the work of two Vatican musicologists named Brunetti and Gemelli. It's my opinion that looking class technology is simply a later technical term for, for a chronovisor. And so I don't think there's any technical or programmatic difference except that the accounts of the looking glass technology don't tell the full story of what Project Pegasus achieved by, let's say, 1970, when it had already developed numerous forms of time travel. In Project Pegasus, we worked with a device that we called the chair, which is clearly the device that the Montauk account identifies as the so-called Montauk chair, which is a magnetic transducer that essentially propels the human mind forward in time space so that the person sitting in the chair has a kind of an out-of-body experience where they access a subjective moment in their own future. Having examined the Montauk literature, I've concluded that Project Montauk almost certainly was a spin-off of Project Pegasus, and there'd be pretty profound reasons for doing that. First of all, I know from my own visits to my own subjective future as a child in Project Pegasus that we were frequently providing valid information when we were traveling forward astrally, as it were, psychically, in the Montauk chair. That is to say, the future events and episodes that we were apprehending in the chair were frequently what came to pass in the actual future as we lived it, or as it unraveled in real time. So there was an accuracy benefit to, to the Montauk chair. Another reason why they clearly would have spun off another program, another project, as it were, from Project Pegasus, focusing on the Montauk chair, is that it had the benefit of, of not sending the person bodily anywhere. The person's body remained intact, survived their time travel, sitting back in the chair in the laboratory uh, where the person was then sent forward in time psychically or astrally to their own future. So because of the safety factor and the accuracy, I think they probably spun off Project Montauk from Project Pegasus. I don't know why they limited it exclusively to boys, because in Project Pegasus there was an equal number of of boys and girls who were time traveling. Uh, maybe it was because they were going to be subjecting the chair to different experimental approaches. For example, irradiating the chair, and they thought maybe uh, maybe some of the biological differences between boys and girls uh, would result in less damage to the boys. I don't know. Um, maybe it was they were, they were concerned about developing a baseline, and so they focused on one gender in, in the terms of their experiments or experiences. Uh, in the Montauk chair, but I know I know that Project Montauk occurred, and my public revelations are not antagonistic in any way to the Project Montauk literature because I can I can I can say two things. One is the Montauk chair exists. I took about a hundred probes to my personal future in between 1969 and 72, which for me was the third, fourth, and fifth grade, and many of those life events that I pre-experienced in the Montauk chair have in fact now occurred now that I'm, I'm 50 years old. I can also say that a number of the people that have been claimed to have been associated with the, with Project Montauk yeah, yeah. are actual U.S. time travel pioneers. For example, Preston Nichols and Peter Moon identify a man by the name of Jack Pruitt as the research director of Project Montauk, and I worked extensively with Jack Pruitt on Project Pegasus. He was not the research director, but he was simply a facilitator that would have been referred to as a team leader on Project Pegasus. So both projects existed. I believe that Montauk, which Nichols and Moon State occurred beginning in the early 1980s, was probably a spin-off of Project Pegasus. And they were focusing on that chair because of its accuracy and I think the safety angle. But I clearly think that they may have experimented with with different factors. For example, the radiological conditions in the room when the chair was performing its magnetic transduction, you know, different ways of adjusting the environment that the mag magnetic transduction was operating on to see what the person would experience. But when I was placed in the Montauk chair as a child, of course, we have Dr. David Anderson's statement in 2002 on Coast to Coast AM yeah. that the Montauk chair went national in, 2000, in uh, the spring of 1970 and involved thousands of American school children. So I was one of those school children, and all, all that I experienced in the Montauk chair 
was simply having a kind of a pre-visit of a future event. We would actually go there and you were, you, we weren't seeing ourselves doing things in the future, we were doing it as you would perceive ordinary reality. And then you'd fall asleep or pass out and find yourself back in the chair. Fascinating. So, uh, do, you, do you have time for about three more questions? Sure. Okay, I mean, I could talk to you all day. I love you. <laughs> There's a, okay, uh, the other three questions I wanted to go with. Now, can we get in a little bit about, can we get into a little bit about quantum cohesion uh, and uh, getting into the timelines a little bit here? Because uh, you must be aware of the, the multiple timelines. And as you were saying earlier in your presentation, you were talking about a catastrophic timeline. And I've heard various names used for these timelines, like timeline uh, 183A and stuff like that, that I've heard talked about. Now, I guess what I want to ask you, are we leaning towards a more positive timeline? And my other question is, my uh, math professor friend and I always debate about this. We always talk about, are these timelines simply, simply quantifiable results of parallel universes that we would slip, simply slip into, or are there different versions of ourselves in these different timelines? So basically to sum it up, are we existing in all these timelines or we just go over to a timeline that we are more harmonic with? Well, I only share what I know, and what I know is that when I was accessing alternate timelines on Project Pegasus, of course, we live in we live in a quantum hologram of multiple adjacent alternate timelines, some of which are similar to the timeline that we find ourselves, and some of which are very distant. Much depends on the perspective of of the percipient relative to different event scenarios going on on different timelines. What I can say relative to the question of whether we find alternate versions of ourselves on the other timelines, in other words, if they, actually, if they exist as permanent elements of the other timelines, is this. And that is, I was sent about five or six times to the site of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln uh, in Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. on the evening of April 14th, 1865. Those time probes were undertaken via chronovisor, a chronovisor that was located on the symphony orchestra-sized stage that exists in the gymnasium at the Cerritos Cultural Center in Cerritos, New Mexico. And these probes took place in the summer of 1971 when I was a child on the project. And during each of those probes, because the, because the chronovisor they later found was accessing alternate timelines. So it was somewhat unreliable to establish to an historical and a scientific certainty what had happened at a particular moment of the timeline that we're on, the timeline that was sending children back in time by chronovision in that way, uh, that form of time travel. And what they found is that every time they sent me to the same event, which was the assassination of President Lincoln at Ford's Theater in 1865, the event changed a little bit. And on one of those probes, I saw myself in the lobby of the theater over on the right and thought I was looking, well, it wasn't really the lobby. It was sort of towards the back of the lobby where people would walk along to avoid just traipsing through the lobby. And so there was a wall behind myself, and I, I thought that it was a mirror. In other words, I was walking along, and I thought, oh, I'm seeing myself in a mirror. But then I verged over to the right, such as an image on a mirror wouldn't do. It wasn't me in a mirror, it was me accessing the same timeline from a, from a later probe, a later jump by a chronomizer back to that night. And then during my fifth or sixth probe, I then had that experience and saw myself over on the left. So I think we can infer from that experience that in the same way that we occupy our primary timeline, what I call our alpha timeline, there is also a version of us that is that exists and is doing things in the alternate timelines that we can access if we're accessing the parts of the quantum hologram that overlap our experience. In other words, all of us is born, lives for a number of decades, if we're blessed with length of years, and then we die. So I certainly wasn't running into myself to just one arbitrary place in the past that I was sent. For example, I was sent to, to Holland in around 1800. And this Dutch farm woman helped me out of this irrigation ditch and into her house and served me this 
leek and onion soup, and then virtually everybody in the village came into her barn-like house. And, and so by implication, I think that may indicate that when we, let's say, for example, we visited our, our life 20 years in the past, we could, theoretically, if we went to where we were on a given day and hour and minute of that past, we would find a 20-year younger version of ourselves. Yes. You know, that's interesting. Uh, Michael Talbot's Holograph Universe comes to mind. And there's another thing that comes up. I mean, it really makes us question the linearity of time. Uh, but also, if we were to smuggle in some arguments of transmigration in there, then there's, there could be all sorts of different versions of ourselves in these various uh, timelines. But I, I wanted to come back over into your experiences again here. Could you tell me a little bit about your knowledge of Barry Satoro, a.k.a. Barack Obama, and his involvement with these projects? Well, I was in Project Pegasus as a schoolboy. Uh, roughly, my first experiences were at age six, and then I was dropped officially into Project Pegasus at age seven, turning age eight in September of 1969. And I was in it for three years to the end of the summer of 1972, but I actually had about four years of experience during those three years because I spent three major time loops where I was staying in New Mexico during the summer and then being teleported not just back to New Jersey but to, so as to arrive on the day that I left. I left the project on my alpha timeline you know, in real time at the end of the summer of 72. And then had a fairly conventional junior high and high school period after we moved to Southern California. But in the summer of 1980, I was brought back within the realm of classified defense-related research and development activities for the U.S. government when I was trained for a jump room program that took place from roughly 1981 to 1983. Our training uh, was at the College of the Siskiyous in Wee, California. And among my fellow uh, students during that three-week training uh, program, was a young man attending Occidental College named Barry Satoru, uh, who now is, is known as, as Barack Obama and is serving as the 44th President of the United States. The woman that he appointed the first female director and the 19th director of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, Regina Dugan, who was one of our classmates, uh, as well as one of the whistleblowers who stepped forward, William B. Stillings, was in that class, as was the late space shuttle astronaut, William Cameron Poole, who died uh, tragically while serving as the pilot of the space shuttle Columbia upon its uh, re-entry into Earth's atmosphere on February 1st of 2003. So those were the, in addition to myself, those were the, uh, the five of the ten um, Mars trainees who Brett Stillings and I can confirm were in our training class. The individual going by the name of Barry Satoro and also Regina Dugan and I, during those three weeks, towards the end of those three weeks, we were involved in three months of study there at the college that was effectuated by having us teleport to the beginning of the summer, work there on a threat assessment regarding the Martian humanoid civilization. We were given about a four-inch dossier of secret U.S. documents about uh, the indigenous humanoid civilization on Mars, and each of us was asked to draft a thesis giving our opinion based on the evidence of the Martian, whether or not the Martian humanoid civilization presented a threat uh, to, to human civilization on Earth. And during those three months, I had a chance to get to know Barry better. We roomed together for a while. He was a very taciturn young man. I found it very difficult to get him to say anything. He was kind of shy. He was clearly very bright. He tended to just kind of respond with a few words and laugh at what he said. He was a very, he kept his cards very close to the vest. But he was a bright and very likable young man. We, certainly all of us in the program uh, enjoyed his fellowship very much. We were in the program together, his friendship. And we all got along really famously, almost like you do in college. You know, you have your friends in college. We all kind of really gelled. Um, so I'm speaking out now because the President of the United States was involved in this secret space program, and I think that the time for secrecy regarding these projects has ended, and so I have to be truthful that, as preposterous as it sounds, that somebody now serving as president was in fact in the jump room program, and in fact, Brett Stillings has corroborated that. That's excellent. Now, Andrew, I wanted to ask you about uh, the extraterrestrial involvement here, because 
you mentioned that you know you are going into Mars in this program, and from my understanding, you guys would step through these almost. Correct me if I'm wrong here. These elevator-like contraptions or these doors that would kind of open up. It was. Uh, it was an. El in fact, it was not just an elevator-like contraption. The jump from to Mars that we used was was an elevator in a corporate office building in El Segundo, California, that had a dual use. And and it, it was at 999 North Sepulveda, which was then owned and operated, owned or operated uh, by Hughes Aircraft. And the elevator would go up to the fifth floor from the ground level, and we would check in in a kind of a Fijian suite there. There was sort of a marble counter, and give our name, first and last, our date of birth, our social security number, and our federal ID number, which was a sort of a secret uh, serial number that we had. I actually still remember mine. I won't say what it is on the air, but I actually still don't remember that that number. Um, it was a nine-digit number. Uh, and then we would sign the book and step back into the elevator, go up to the eighth floor. The elevator that then would move horizontally across the eighth floor, where there's a kind of a pod that you can see at the back of 999, 999 North Sepulveda in Segundo, California. It's a sort of an extension at the back of the building. And we would be communicated with by a, a sort of a telecom as to whether we were ready to go or not. And when we were, we would say yes, and lights would start flashing at the bottom and top of the elevator. And it would morph into a cylinder. The box-like structure would begin morphing, slowly turning into a, cyl a cylinder. The, the ceiling would migrate to the side, and you would see this swirling pattern at the end of the cylinder. And that would last for about 10 minutes or so. We would feel pressure, the kind of pressure that you you might experience at about 40 feet underwater. It's about two atmospheres of pressure. And um, and then it would start correcting itself back into the box-like form of the elevator. And about five minutes later, the door would open, and we were in an underground facility on what we had been trained was Mars. Now, since I've come forward publicly, the individual who investigated the Mars project for the CIA has contacted me and he stated that when I was on the project with Barry and Regina and Brett and, and possibly Willie, we don't know, he was only in class for about a week, uh, but certainly Barry, Regina and Brett were involved in jumps to what we had been trained was Mars. This individual, an individual by the name of Bernard, who at this point does not want to give his last name, but will be coming forward publicly this summer, we hope, to share what he knows about the jumping program, uh, has informed me that he found during his investigation that we were not visiting Mars in real time, but these synthetic quantum environments that, that have been architected by the gray ETs that the U.S. astronauts call slots. They're basically folds in the fabric of time space where extraterrestrials have sort of engineered uh, synthetic environments, for example, how Mars might have been a million years ago. So there's a dispute. Now, now, Bernie was a project participant. I went up with Bernie and Regina and another one of the, of the women on the project. I don't have her name. We're, we think we know who it is, but we're not going to public with the identity of that chrononaut yet until we get the permission. Uh, we've tentatively identified her as a member of a very prominent family, uh, and so we want to approach her and question her about her memories. Uh, but basically, uh, Bernie stated that he concluded forensically, when he was investigating the project when we were on it, that we were not visiting Mars, but a kind of a recapitulation of Mars that the gray ETs had, had, had designed in kind of a solid state device. And that begs the question of really where the jump rooms came from. We may have been lent the jump rooms from the grays with them telling us, look, this is going to allow your personnel to get to Mars. Now, Brett Stillings is very adamant that it was Mars. He believes that he's found one of the jump rooms, the jump room that we call the corkscrew, because it had a kind of a conch shell pattern that brought us up to the surface from the below ground location of where the elevator would arrive, the jump room would arrive on Mars, or, or whatever terrestrial domain we were visiting. Um, I, my position falls somewhat between Brett's and Bernie's. I, I know we were trained for Mars, and it certainly seemed like Mars in real time, but at the same time, I went on the night run with Bernie and Regina and several others, including the woman, woman that we've identified, or probably identified. And some very strange stuff happened that indicated that it may have been some kind of synthetic environment. And so, as a figure in the truth movement, I'm not going to stipulate my truth. I'm just simply going to share my truth. 
and let others share their truth. And certainly Bernie's truth is that we were not accessing Mars, but we were accessing another terrestrial domain. And that, in fact, is why the U.S. was so eager to, to, to pursue the Jumplin program, because it was literally opening up new land that could be acquired, territorially speaking, by the United States. Um, so we're now in a situation where two individuals who were in the training with me and also operationally were visiting this domain and time space that we were accessing with the jump in, have stepped forward, Brett publicly, Bernie soon publicly, and corroborated my account that we were in the program. In fact, Bernie can corroborate that the three young people you remembered in the training program and then going up to, to Mars with were myself, Barry Satoro, which is Barack Obama, and Regina Duke, and he remembers all three of us. So the individuals at this point in time are most prominent, namely the President, Regina with all of her accomplishments for the Defense Department, and myself as a crusading lawyer who is bringing about public awareness about the advent of these technologies, Bernie can confirm and now is corroborating our involvement in the Jumping Program. Now could you tell me, uh, one last question, could you tell me about your involvement with the extraterrestrials, did you get to see any of them on Mars? Were they uh, bipedal? Were they uh, humanoid? Were they greys? Uh, do, you, do you have any descriptions? I had contact with the small greys throughout my childhood. We believe that part of that may have been a result of my father's work on the U.S. government's response to the extraterrestrial situation. I mean, my dad was literally ordered by the U.S. military to report to Curtis Wright in October of 1952 after the famous uh, extraterrestrial overflight of Washington, D.C. in July of 1952 to work on the Ramjet, which was a high-performance jet aircraft that was intended to chase the extraterrestrials out of our atmosphere and near-Earth environment. In fact, my dad was on the team that designed the metal alloy by which it was hoped that the ramjet engine and the fuselage and so forth wouldn't melt uh, in our atmosphere from air molecules of air coming into friction with the with the craft and in space with the craft coming into friction with molecules of space dust. And so my dad was a principal on the ramjet project. So if extraterrestrial contact occurred among young people in my generation as a result of let's say their father's work in the U.S. government's response to the extraterrestrial situation. My very numerous contacts with the small gray extraterrestrials in my childhood may have been a result of them investigating my father. For example, I was told by one CIA official that people working in the defense industry were actually tracking certain industrial substances home to their residences. So that allowed the extraterrestrials to study, for the ex example, the children of our astronauts, our aerospace engineers, and so forth. Now, I had two specific encounters with extraterrestrials, one on Project Pegasus and one in the Mars program, so I can, I, can, I can describe those for you. When I was a child serving in Project Pegasus, there was kind of a summit, there was an intentional meeting that was arranged by two of the taller greys and two of the children, one of them being myself, in New Mexico in an underground location. And I was told that the reason that that meeting was facilitated is, quote unquote, the aliens wanted to meet some of the children of our project. Okay, so I can confirm that Project Pegasus itself was in liaison with at least one extraterrestrial species. But I have to give you the caveat that most of the technologies we were working on were derived from human sources. For example, the latter works of Nikola Tesla and not reverse engineered from extraterrestrial technology. The second encounter with extraterrestrials that occurred in the project context, rather than just garden variety ET contact, uh, sort of along the lines of the alien abduction scenario in my childhood, was on the surface of Mars or whatever domain we were accessing via the jump rooms. I came out of, again, the jump room that we call the corkscrew, in front of Courtney Hunt of the CIA and Brett Stillings, and as I exited the building, I looked up on the roof and there was about a four and a half foot tall gray extraterrestrial sort of sitting kind of tentatively on the roof of the jump room. And because we were essentially in a military footing and we were trying to keep each other alive on the surface, I yelled out to Courtney and Brett, Courtney, Brett, a gray up on the roof observing us. And, and Brett, has, uh, Brett has corroborated that. So that was an encounter with the gray extraterrestrial 
in that domain of time space, whether that was Mars. You know, I found similar creatures in NASA's photographs of the Martian surface. I published an image in my paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars in 2008, that was the first image of a humanoid on another planet to be published on Earth. So there, and I also had corroboration from, from a career CIA official that on Mars there's a population of about a million humanoids and there are several different typologies. One that looks very much like us and then another that is smaller and thinner and has longer fingers and kind of pointier ears and then one that even more looks like the gray extraterrestrials of the UFO contact literature. So that was one of the third typology that was up on the surface if, if in fact we were architect, if in fact we were um, accessing Mars. If we were ar if we were if we were accessing a, a, a domain that the Greys had architected in the time-space continuum, then that was li literally one of the Greys who was the stage manager of whatever domain we were visiting. So I can confirm that these classified defense-related research and development projects undertaken by the U.S. government in the 60s, 70s, and 80s were definitely in contact with extraterrestrials. But I do so cautiously because. When you state that, it's often presumed that the technology was from extraterrestrial sources. And in fact, while the Montauk chair probably was reverse engineered from the chair that the ET pilot sits on to actually pilot a lenticular craft psychically, um, and while uh, the jump rooms may have been provided by the great ETs, most of the time travel technologies that the U.S. government has secretly developed were developed based on human sources ancient sources, Nazi German and Soviet Russian sources, uh, the work of leading inventors of the 20th century, individuals like Nikola Tesla. So we should be proud actually as a humanoid civilization on Earth that we were responsible ultimately for our time-space capability because even in the case of where we took extraterrestrial technology and reverse engineered it, we still had to figure out how it worked for applying it. Some might argue that uh, Nikola Tesla was either in contact with ETs or may very well been one in some of his autobiographical work and whatnot. But I absolutely think you're right there that we have some incredible, uh, incredible technology to be proud of that we've come up with. So what does the public need to know next about time travel? Really what the public needs to know is that time travel is not something that's a speculative subject. It's not something that's going to develop in the future. Time travel was achieved secretly in the U.S. defense technical community over 40 years ago. And some of the technologies hold incredible promise for the human race on Earth. Clearly the Tesla teleporter can be used to allow for an almost instantaneous form of transport around the world. A form of transport that's safer, cheaper, more efficient, and more environmentally benign. And so I'm speaking out because I feel ethically compelled to do so because I believe that the best available technology that exists should be deployed by human civilization on Earth uh, to move human beings around the surface of our planet. And if you look at automobile transport right now, people basically get from point A to point B with two to 4,000 pounds of metal strapped around their waist with their seatbelt. That's incredibly inefficient. And so I believe we need to sponsor a global technology transfer program from the secret place that teleportation is held within the U.S. governmental context to all of the countries of the planet, create an international system, a global system of teleports where people, for example, somebody in London, to uh, England, could get to Sydney, Australia, not in 24 hours aboard a uh, commercial airline, but in several seconds. Now, that technical capability has been available since the late 1960s, but it's been kept secret because teleportation was weaponized by the U.S. Defense Department. That's been an historical disaster. So I'm trying to carry on my late father's work, his support for the ultimate public use, public deployment of teleportation as the leading form of civilian transport. It's the best available technology that we have. Now the world needs to learn that, and we need to pressure the United States government to declassify that technology and create a global system of teleports. The other principal technology that Project Pegasus is working with is chronovision. Now imagine how inspired school children would be if they could go to a national museum or library in their country and view the auspicious moments of their national history and then take it back even further into the Middle Ages and then further back into antiquity and all the way back into the primordial time on Earth. That 
technical capability has been available since 1970. And yet Chronovision has, again, has been sequestered within the U.S. defense technical and U.S. intelligence community and military because it allows for remote sensing, not only of objects in real time, and events in real time, but remote sensing in the past and future. In other words, they can drive a van past somebody's house and not only look into what's going on in their bedroom or bathroom in real time, but what went on in their bedroom and bathroom five years ago or what will go on in their bedroom and bathroom five years from now. In other words, this very promising technology that could have been used to spark a revolution in education and in science and in just public understanding of what went on in the past has been kept secret as basically a disruptive technology that could all be could be used against all of us in the fashioning of a 24-hour fascist totalitarian surveillance state. And in fact, that was the thrust of George, President George W. Bush's initiative under Admiral John Poindexter of total information awareness. That was wedding modern digital technology with some of these hidden technologies like Chronovision to create basically a 24-hour surveillance state. And I view that as a threat to human freedom, to our civil liberties, to our privacy. And so I'm speaking out regarding Chronovision because I want to foster a society where the positive aspects of Chronovision are used to inspire people. Imagine being able to see, the, see a hologram of, of Shakespeare writing one of his plays, or George Washington crossing the Delaware, or Abraham Lincoln giving the Gettysburg Address, um, from eras before the existence of very much still photography and obviously no motion picture technology. That capability has been available to civilization since 1970. And people don't even know Chronovision exists, but it does because I encountered it in different instances when I was a ch when I was serving on, on Project Pegasus over 40 years ago. The first Chronovision image I saw was of the actual signing of the U.S. Constitution on about an eight-inch screen on a device that was at a National Security Watch post in Flemington, New Jersey, where they were filming the past and dropping 16-millimeter film stock with past events on it in canisters and putting the place and time of what they were filming and just dropping them in in storage crates. So there's a disruptive, a, a socially disruptive threat to Chronovision, which again is the invasion of individual privacy, but there's the, the incredible promise of giving people literally a window to the past to compare our lives with, with what it was like in, let's say, in Abraham Lincoln's time. And I think if people could see that, they would appreciate the fact that we're living in a society that is starting to become advanced. We've obviously done great harm to the environment in fashioning that society, but we're living in a, a, a propitious era. We're lucky to be alive during this period of human history, where for most of the time we can be well-fed and sheltered and clothed and comfortable. And we should be more diligent about what we're trying to achieve during our lifetimes because of all the human comforts that we enjoy that even caused difficulty even 200 years ago or 100 years ago. I mean, I was sent by a chronovision to the Five Points neighborhood of New York City in 1905. Before the mass advent of automobiles, there was, there was horse manure throughout the streets. I was living in a tenement with about 10 orphans and several young men who were working, who were absolutely exhausted when they would come home from work and were at a factory. This wonderful Irish immigrant woman was serving basically onion soup to all of us at night. Din dinner consisted of soup. And the tenement we were living in was so filthy that solid human waste was being openly discarded in the center of the building. The entire building reeked of hu human waste. I became profoundly depressed because while I was told that I would be in these past locations of only 15 minutes, I was in that location in time space for three days and two nights just trying to bear the smell of the place. And I became deeply depressed because I didn't believe I was going to get home. Finally, a portal was inserted near me, and I was able to jump through the portal and get home to 1971. So if people could see images of some of the squalid tenements, even in relatively modern Western cities, even in 1900, they would see that we're living in really great times, and we should do significant things with our lives as a result of that. We shouldn't just enjoy all the comforts. We should utilize the comforts to make life comfortable and then do productive and progressive and proactive things with our time on earth. That's why all these creature comforts were created, 
so that people could use their minds and collaborate together creatively to create an even better society. And I don't think enough of us, or society in general, are, are really consciously focused on the fact of how lucky we are. And I think if we had you know, museums that the average person could go to, here in beautiful Vancouver, BC, you could have maybe one of the Canadian National Archives where there'd be a virtual museum and you could see auspicious moments in Canadian history. Uh, maybe have a time series from different eras of Canadian history before the advent of photography and especially of, of television and motion pictures and be inspired by it. And that such a world has been available since 1970. And I think it's a tragedy that, that the weaponization of these time travel technologies has not allowed for their social benefits to be deployed as they should have been 40 years ago. There most certainly is a, an incredible phenomenological aspect to going into a museum like that and being able to experience it in uh, sort of a real time. Well, my question for you is is that you, you've you taken a peek into 2045, am I, am I guessing? I went there. Now, I, because Project Pegasus didn't just involve the remote sensing of time via devices like the Chronovisor. It involved four devices that were physically sending us to the past and future. But here's a question for you. Were there any changes or adaptations in the media ecology there? Or did you recognize any devices, uh, any additions of technology, or the, the lack of technology that would be needed for, let's say, a telepathic or yeah, metamorphic I, I communication? Accessed, yeah, I accessed something that was in the nature of like an industrial park in a southwestern United States location. The environment was somewhat more temperate than it is now. There was some shift in the local ecology to a warmer, wetter, well, not a warmer, but a wetter, more Midwestern, sort of East Coast sort of biome there in the Southwest. I don't know exactly where it was. It may have been outside of Blackstaff, Arizona. It's kind of a green desert sort of environment, you know, a desert with fairly sparse vegetation, but, but richer, more temperate plants than you find in the current desert Southwest. And I, I accessed 2045. <coughs> Cut. <coughs> This is 2045 by a Stargate. The term Stargate was used in Project Pegasus. In fact, Stargate Atlantis actually had an episode, I believe, called Project Pegasus. So this is how these terms from the secret research that's gone on in the U.S. and other countries has dropped into mainstream media uh, shows. Um, but I jumped to 2045 by a Stargate device that was set up on the gymnasium floor at the Cerritos Cultural Center outside Cerritos, New Mexico. And I was in a Vortal tunnel for about 30 seconds. We had been trained to kind of breathe off the top of our lungs in the, because we were in the tunnel for so long. I was an alto sax player, so that was pretty easy to do. And I arrived in this big pedestrian plaza. There were no automobiles, none of the danger, congestion, noise, or air pollution of automobiles. People were moving about on foot, on bicycles, and on segways. So Dean Kamen's Segway is definitely in wider use in 2045 in these large pedestrian plazas. And um, I walked towards the building where I was to pick up these microfilm summaries of intervening events between the 1970s and the 2040s. And it was a beautiful emerald green building, green glass, sort of brushed stainless steel or tungsten sort of metal architecture to the building. Very beautiful building. And um, it was at that location that I asked, well, how do I get home? How do I get back to 1972? Because they were going to send us back to the grounds around the microwave antenna array at the Lobo Overlook Point, which is north of Pagosa Springs, Colorado, and west of the Continental Divide sign there on Highway 160 between Pagosa Springs and Colorado Springs, Colorado. And we knew that they had told us, they had shown us during our training how that microwave tower pings out into the cosmos so that team members in the future can identify our location in time space. So I knew where I was going to be arriving back in real time, you know, back in 1972, but I didn't know how until I was in this forward location. And the man who gave me the microfilm canister took me into what was in the nature of a boardroom. It was a relatively small room with a big table with about 12 chairs kind of like a corporate boardroom would be in, the current, in our current era. And he said, the teleporter's right there. And I said, I don't see it. I mean, I was used to 
either the parenthesis shaped teleporter back at Curtis Wright that we were using to get to New Mexico, which was like, there was an identical one at Sandia in New Mexico that we were using to get back to New Jersey. And I was also familiar with this big black arch-like structure that where we were running up this ramp and going through a neon blue notch of light at the bottom of the Stargate. But I didn't know what the teleporters in the future looked like. And all he did is point to the small wall on the side, on that smaller side of this rectilinear boardroom. And he said, it's right there. I said, I don't see anything. I mean, if I run against that wall, I'm going to smack, smack my face. Right? I might knock myself unconscious if I, if I run against the wall of your conference right here. And he said, Andy, if you want to get home to the present, you're going to have to trust me and run against that wall. And I want you to run against it hard, you know, to get through it and, and you know, to get into the Vortal Tunnel. So the point of the story is that based on my personal experience in 2045, I can confirm that teleportation is so ubiquitous and so seamlessly integrated into the built environment by 2045 that it is literally invisibly recessed into walls. So you have a home, a community center, a business, uh, uh, a government building, and it's just marked as teleport, and you can choose your location and literally run against the wall and enter a portal tunnel and then be repositioned in the time-space continuum. So 33 years out from 2012, teleportation defines transportation in the 21st century. And that's why I'm speaking out about it, because I had the privilege of teleporting as a New Jersey school child in the early 70s when these technologies were emerging and they wanted to test them on children and, and essentially train us to become the next cadre of, of adult chrononauts. Um, I know that my truth campaign around these time travel technologies is successful because I was informed by Courtney M. Hunt of the CIA that essentially my work forms the historical bridge between what Project Pegasus achieved in the research and development of time travel technologies in the early 1970s and the ultimate global public adoption of teleportation. So as I said in today's talk here at the Roundhouse in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia, the, the ultimate point for me in my truth campaign will be when I cut the red ribbon at Grand Central Teleport in New York City. Now, can I, can I ask you a question here, Andrew? How can people get in touch with you? How can they find out more about your work? Uh, I'm still building it. I'm about two years behind because I've primarily been doing interviews. But my time travel uh, related truth campaign is at projectpegasus.net. Uh, I'm calling my campaign Project Pegasus for the uh, U.S. Time Space Program that was part of as a child to pretty much take back that, that term and own it because at this point I'm one of the few people from the project who stepped forward but I would add, as I discussed today, I'm not the only one who has now come forward. As a result of my 10-year effort, others are now coming forward, for example, to talk about their involvement in the Jump Room Program in the early 1980s, which was utilizing, may still be in existence, but in the early 80s it was utilizing one of the time travel technologies that was just emerging when I was a child on Project Pegasus in the early 70s. So we're at the point now where multiple project participants are coming forward, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. That's a fascinating thing. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, John. And, and have a great day.